Symbolic Logic by Lewis Carroll. A syllogism worked out. That story of yours about your once meeting the sea serpent always sets me off yawning. I never yawn unless when I'm listening to something totally devoid of interest. The premises separately. The premises combined. The conclusion. That story of yours about your once meeting the sea serpent is totally devoid of interest. The end of the syllogism. Advertisement. An envelope containing two blank diagrams, biliteral and triliteral, and nine counters, four red and five gray, may be had from Messrs. Macmillan for threepence by post fourpence. I shall be granted to any reader of this book who will point out any mistakes or misprints he may happen to notice in it, or any passage which he thinks is not clearly expressed. I have a quantity of manuscript in hand for parts two and three, and hope to be able, should life and health and opportunity be granted to me, to publish them in the course of the next few years. Their contents will be as follows. Part two, advanced. Further investigations in the subjects of part one. Propositions of other forms, such as not all, X, or Y. Triliteral and multiliteral propositions, such as all ABC, or DE. Hypotheticals, dilemmas, etc., etc. Part three, transcendental. Analysis of a proposition into its elements, numerical and geometrical problems, the theory of inference, the construction of problems, and many other curiosa logica. The end of advertisement. Preface to the fourth edition. The chief alterations since the first edition have been made in the chapter on classification, pages two and three, and the book on propositions, pages 10 to 19. The chief additions have been the questions on words and phrases added to the examination papers at page 94 and the notes inserted at pages 164 and 189. In Book 1, Chapter 2, I have adopted a new definition of classification, which enables me to regard the whole universe as a class, and thus to dispense with the very awkward phrase, a set of things. In the chapter on propositions of existence, I have adopted a new normal form in which the class whose existence is affirmed or denied is regarded as the predicate instead of the subject of the proposition thus evading a very subtle difficulty which besets the other form. These subtle difficulties seem to lie at the root of every tree of knowledge, and they are far more hopeless to grapple with than any that occur in its higher branches. For example, the difficulties of the 47th proposition of Euclid are mere child's play compared with the mental torture endured in the effort to think out the essential nature of a straight line. And in the present work, the difficulties of the five liars problem at page 188 are trifles, light as air, compared with the bewildering question, what is a thing? In the chapter on propositions of relation, I have inserted a new section containing the proof that a proposition beginning with all is a double proposition, a fact that is quite independent of the arbitrary rule laid down in the next section, that such a proposition is to be understood as implying the actual existence of its subject. This proof was given in the earlier editions, incidentally in the course of the discussion of the biliteral diagram, but its proper place in this treatise is where I have now introduced it. Preface to Fourth Edition In the Sorites examples, I have made a good many verbal alterations in order to evade a difficulty which I fear will have perplexed some of the readers of the first three editions. Some of the premises were so worded that their terms were not species of the universe named in the dictionary, but of a larger class of which the universe was only a portion. In all such cases, it was intended that the reader should perceive that what was asserted of the larger class was thereby asserted of the universe, and should ignore as superfluous all that it asserted of its other portion. Thus, in example 15, the universe was stated to be ducks in this village, and the third premise was Mrs. Bond has no gray ducks, that is, no gray ducks are ducks belonging to Mrs. Bond. Here the terms are not species of the universe, but of the larger class ducks, of which the universe is only a portion, and it was intended that the reader should perceive that what is here asserted of ducks is thereby asserted of ducks in this village, and should treat this premise as if it were Mrs. Bond has no gray ducks in this village, 
and should ignore as superfluous what it asserts as to the other portion of the class ducks. Mrs. Bond has no gray ducks out of this village. In the appendix, I have given a new version of the problem of the five liars. My object in doing so is to escape the subtle and mysterious difficulties which beset all attempts at regarding a proposition as being its own subject, or a set of propositions as being subjects for one another. It is certainly a most bewildering and unsatisfactory theory. One cannot help feeling that there is a great lack of substance in all this shadowy host, that, as the procession of phantoms glides before us, there is not one that we can pounce upon and say, here is a proposition that must be either true or false. That is but a barmecide feast to which we have been bidden, and that its prototype is to be found in that mythical island whose inhabitants earned a precarious living by taking in each other's washing. By simply translating, telling two truths into taking both of two condiments, salt and mustard, telling two lies into taking neither of them, and telling a truth and a lie, order not specified, into taking only one condiment, it is not specified which. I have escaped all those metaphysical puzzles and have produced a problem which, when translated into a set of symbolized premises, furnishes the very same data as were furnished by the problem of the five liars. The coined words introduced in previous editions, such as eliminans and retinans, perhaps hardly need any apology. They were indispensable to my system, but the new plural here used for the first time, namely seritases, will, I fear, be condemned as bad English unless I say a word in its defense. We have three singular nouns in English of plural form, series, species, and serites. In all three, the awkwardness of using the same word for both singular and plural must often have been felt. This has been remedied in the case of series by coining the plural series, which has already found its way into the dictionaries. So I am no rash innovator, but am merely following suit in using the new plural serites. In conclusion, let me point out that even those who are obliged to study formal logic with a view to being able to answer examination papers in that subject will find the study of symbolic logic most helpful for this purpose in throwing light upon many of the obscurities with which formal logic abounds and in furnishing a delightfully easy method of testing the results arrived at by the cumbrous processes which formal logic enforces upon its votaries. This is, I believe, the very first attempt with the exception of my own little book, The Game of Logic, published in 1886, a very incomplete performance that has been made to popularize this fascinating subject. It has cost me years of hard work, but if it should prove, as I hope it may, to be of real service to the young and to be taken up in high schools and in private families as a valuable addition to their stock of healthful mental recreations, such a result would more than repay ten times the labor that I have expended on it. Lewis Carroll, 29 Bedford Street, Strand, Christmas, 1896. The End of the Preface Introduction To Learners The learner who wishes to try the question fairly, whether this little book does or does not supply the materials for a most interesting mental recreation, is earnestly advised to adopt the following rules. 1. Begin at the beginning, and do not allow yourself to gratify a mere idle curiosity by dipping into the book here and there. This would very likely lead to your throwing it aside with the remark, this is much too hard for me, and thus losing the chance of adding a very large item to your stock of mental delights. This rule, of not dipping, is very desirable with other kinds of books, such as novels, for instance, where you may easily spoil much of the enjoyment you would otherwise get from the story by dipping into it further on so that what the author meant to be a pleasant surprise comes to you as a matter of course. Some people I know make a practice of looking into Volume 3 first, just to see how the story ends, and perhaps it is as well just to know that all ends happily, that the much-persecuted lovers do marry after all, that he has proved to be quite innocent of the murder, that the wicked cousin is completely foiled in his plot and gets the punishment he deserves, and that the rich uncle in India... Question. Why in India? Answer, because somehow uncles never can get rich anywhere else, dies at exactly the right moment before taking the trouble to read Volume 1. This, I say, is just permissible with a novel where Volume 3 has a meaning, even for those who have not read the earlier part of the story. But with a scientific book, it is sheer insanity. You will find the latter part hopelessly unintelligible if you read it before reaching it in regular course. 2. 
Don't begin any fresh chapter or section until you are certain that you thoroughly understand the whole book up to that point, and that you have worked correctly most, if not all, of the examples which have been set. So long as you are conscious that all the land you have passed through is absolutely conquered, and that you are leaving no unsolved difficulties behind you which will be sure to turn up again later on, your triumphal progress will be easy and delightful. Otherwise, you will find your state of puzzlement get worse and worse as you proceed, till you give up the whole thing in utter disgust. 3. When you come to any passage you don't understand, read it again. If you still don't understand it, read it again. If you fail even after three readings, very likely your brain is getting a little tired. In that case, put the book away and take to other occupations, and next day, when you come to it fresh, you will very likely find that it is quite easy. 4. If possible, find some genial friend who will read the book along with you and will talk over the difficulties with you. Talking is a wonderful smoother over of difficulties. When I come upon anything, in logic or in any other hard subject, that entirely puzzles me, I find it a capital plan to talk it over, aloud, even when I am all alone. One can explain things so clearly to oneself. And then, you know, one is so patient with oneself, one never gets irritated at one's own stupidity. If, dear reader, you will faithfully observe these rules, and so give my little book a really fair trial, I promise you most confidently that you will find symbolic logic to be one of the most, if not the most, fascinating of mental recreations. In this first part, I have carefully avoided all difficulties which seem to me to be beyond the grasp of an intelligent child of, say, twelve or fourteen years of age. I have myself taught most of its concepts, viva voce, to many children, and have found them take a real intelligent interest in the subject. For those who succeed in mastering part one, and who begin, like Oliver, asking for more, I hope to provide in part two some tolerably hard nuts to crack, nuts that will require all the nutcrackers they happen to possess. Mental recreation is a thing that we all of us need for our mental health, and you may get much healthy enjoyment, no doubt, from games such as backgammon, chess, and the new game, Halma. But after all, when you have made yourself a first-rate player at any one of these games, you have nothing real to show for it as a result. You enjoyed the game, and the victory, no doubt, at the time, but you have no result that you can treasure up and get real good out of. And all the while you have been leaving unexplored a perfect mine of wealth. Once master the machinery of symbolic logic, and you have a mental occupation always at hand of absorbing interest, and one that will be of real use to you in any subject you may take up. It will give you clearness of thought, the ability to see your way through a puzzle, the habit of arranging your ideas in an orderly and get addable form, and, more valuable than all, the power to detect fallacies and to tear to pieces the flimsy, illogical arguments which you will so continually encounter in books, in newspapers, in speeches, and even in sermons, and which so easily delude those who have never taken the trouble to master this fascinating art. Try it. That is all I ask of you. Lewis Carroll 29 Bedford Street, Strand, February 21st, 1896. The End of the Introduction. Book One, Things and Their Attributes, Chapter One. Introductory. The universe contains things. For example, I, London, roses, redness, old English books, the letter which I received yesterday. Things have attributes, for example, large, red, old, which I received yesterday. One thing may have many attributes, and one attribute may belong to many things. Thus, the thing, a rose, may have the attributes red, scented, full-blown, etc., and the attribute red may belong to the things, a rose, a brick, a ribbon, etc., any attribute or any set of attributes may be called adjunct. This word is introduced in order to avoid the constant repetition of the phrase attribute or set of attributes. Thus, we may say that a rose has the attribute red, or the adjunct red, whichever we prefer. Or, we may say that it has the adjunct red, scented, and full-blown. The End of Chapter 1 
Chapter 2 Classification Classification, or the formation of classes, is a mental process in which we imagine that we have put together in a group certain things. Such a group is called a class. This process may be performed in three different ways as follows. 1. We may imagine that we have put together all things the class so formed. That is, the class things contains the whole universe. 2. We may think of the class things and may imagine that we have picked out from it all the things which possess a certain adjunct not possessed by the whole class. This adjunct is said to be peculiar to the class so formed. In this case, the class things is called a genus with regard to the class so formed. The class so formed is called a species of the class things, and its peculiar adjunct is called its differentia. As this process is entirely mental, we can perform it whether there is or is not an existing thing which possesses that adjunct. If there is, the class is said to be real. If not, it is said to be unreal or imaginary. For example, we may imagine that we have picked out from the class things all the things which possess the adjunct material, artificial, consisting of houses and street, and we may thus form the real class, towns. Here, we may regard things as a genus, towns as a species of things, and material, artificial, consisting of houses and streets, as its differentia. Again, we may imagine that we have picked out all the things which possess the adjunct weighing a ton, easily lifted by a baby, and we may thus form the imaginary class, things that weigh a ton and are easily lifted by a baby. 3. We may think of a certain class, not the class things, and may imagine that we have picked out from it all the members of it which possess a certain adjunct not possessed by the whole class. This adjunct is said to be peculiar to the smaller class so formed. In this case, the class thought of is called a genus with regard to the smaller class picked out from it. The smaller class is called a species of the larger, and its peculiar adjunct is called its differentia. For example, we may think of the class towns and imagine that we have picked out from it all the towns which possess the attribute lit with gas, and we may thus form the real class towns lit with gas. Here may regard towns as a genus, towns lit with gas as a species of towns, and lit with gas as its differentia. If in the above example we were to alter lit with gas into paved with gold, we should get the imaginary class towns paved with gold. A class containing only one member is called an individual. For example, the class towns having four million inhabitants, which class contains only one member, namely London. Hence, any single thing which we can name so as to distinguish it from all other things may be regarded as a one-member class. Thus, London may be regarded as the one-member class picked out from the class towns, which has, as its differentia, having four million inhabitants. A class containing two or more members is sometimes regarded as one single thing. When so regarded, it may possess an adjunct which is not possessed by any member of it taken separately. Thus, the class, the soldiers of the 10th Regiment, when regarded as one single thing, may possess the attribute formed in square, which is not possessed by any member of it taken separately. The End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Division 1. Introductory Division is a mental process in which we think of a certain class of things and imagine that we have divided it into two or more smaller classes. Thus, we might think of the class books and imagine that we had divided it into the two smaller classes, bound books and unbound books, or into the three classes, books priced at less than a shilling, shilling books, books priced at more than a shilling, or into the 26 classes, books whose names begin with A, books whose names begin with B, and so forth. A class that has been obtained by a certain division is said to be co-divisional with every class obtained by that division. Thus the class bound books is co-divisional with each of the two classes, bound books and unbound books. Similarly, 
the Battle of Waterloo may be said to have been contemporary with every event that happened in 1815. Hence, a class obtained by division is co-divisional with itself. Thus, the class bound books is co-divisional with itself. Similarly, the Battle of Waterloo may be said to have been contemporary with itself. Dichotomy If we think of a certain class and imagine that we have picked out from it a certain smaller class, it is evident that the remainder of the large class does not possess the differentia of that smaller class. Hence, it may be regarded as another smaller class whose differentia may be formed from that of the class first picked out by prefixing the word not, and we may imagine that we have divided the class first thought of into two smaller classes whose differentiae are contradictory. This kind of division is called dichotomy. For example, we may divide books into the two classes whose differentiae are old and not old. In performing this process, we have sometimes found that the attributes which we have chosen are used so loosely in ordinary conversation that it is not easy to decide which of the things belong to the one class and which to the other. In such a case, it would be necessary to lay down some arbitrary rule as to where the one class should end and the other begin. Thus, in dividing books into old and not old, we may say, let all books printed before A.D. 1801 be regarded as old, and all others as not old. Henceforward, let it be understood that if a class of things be divided into two classes whose differentiae have contrary meanings, each differentia is to be regarded as equivalent to the other with the word not prefixed. Thus, if books be divided into old and new, the attribute old is to be regarded as equivalent to not new and the attribute new as equivalent to not old. After dividing a class by the process of dichotomy into two smaller classes, we may subdivide each of these into two still smaller classes, and this process may be repeated over and over again, the number of classes being doubled at each repetition. For example, we may divide books into old and new, that is, not old, we may then subdivide each of these into English and foreign, that is, not English, thus getting four classes, namely 1. Old English 2. Old Foreign 3. New English 4. New Foreign If we had begun by dividing into English and foreign, and had then subdivided into old and new, the four classes would have been 1. English Old, 2. English New, 3. Foreign Old, 4. Foreign New. The reader will easily see that these are the very same four classes which we had before. The End of Chapter 3 Chapter 4 Names The word thing, which conveys the idea of a thing without any idea of an adjunct, represents any single thing. Any other word or phrase which conveys the idea of a thing with the idea of an adjunct represents anything which possesses that adjunct. That is, it represents any member of the class to which that adjunct is peculiar. Such a word or phrase is called a name, and if there be an existing thing which it represents, it is said to be a name of that thing. For example, the words thing, treasure, town, and the phrases valuable thing, material artificial thing consisting of houses and streets, town lit with gas, town paved with gold, old English book. Just as a class is said to be real or unreal according as there is or is not an existing thing in it, so also a name is said to be real or unreal according as there is or is not an existing thing represented by it. Thus, town lit with gas is a real name, town paved with gold is an unreal name. Every name is either a substantive only, or else a phrase consisting of a substantive and one or more adjectives, or phrases, used as adjectives. Every name except thing may usually be expressed in three different forms. A. The substantive thing and one or more adjectives, or phrases, used as adjectives, conveying the ideas of the attributes. B. A substantive conveying the idea of a thing with the ideas of some of the attributes and one or more adjectives or phrases used as adjectives conveying the ideas of the other attributes. C. 
a substantive conveying the idea of a thing with the ideas of all the attributes. Thus, the phrase, material living thing, belonging to the animal kingdom, having two hands and two feet, is a name expressed in form A. If we choose to roll up together the substantive thing and the adjectives, material, living, belonging to the animal kingdom, so as to make the new substantive animal, we get the phrase, animal having two hands and two feet, which is a name representing the same thing as before, expressed in form B. And if we choose to roll up the whole phrase into one word, so as to make the new substantive man, we get a name still representing the very same thing expressed in form C. A name whose substantive is in the plural number may be used to represent either 1. Members of a class regarded as separate things, or 2. A whole class regarded as one single thing. Thus, when I say, some soldiers of the 10th Regiment are tall, or the soldiers of the 10th Regiment are brave, I am using the name soldiers of the 10th Regiment in the first sense, and it is just the same as if I were to point to each of them separately and to say, this soldier of the 10th Regiment is tall, that soldier of the 10th Regiment is tall, and so on. But when I say the soldiers of the 10th Regiment are formed in square, I am using the phrase in the second sense, and it is just the same as if I were to say the 10th Regiment is formed in square. The end of chapter 4. Chapter 5. Definitions. It is evident that every member of a species is also a member of the genus out of which that species has been picked, and that it possesses the differentia of that species. Hence, it may be represented by a name consisting of two parts, one being a name representing any member of the genus, and the other being the differentia of that species. Such a name is called a definition of any member of that species, and to give it such a name is to define it. Thus, we may define a treasure as a valuable thing. In this case, we regard things as the genus and valuable as the differentia. The following examples of this process may be taken as models for working others. Note that, in each definition, the substantive representing a member or members of the genus is printed in capitals. 1. Define a treasure. Answer. A valuable thing. 2. Define treasures. Answer. Valuable things. 3. Define a town. Answer. A material, artificial thing consisting of houses and streets. 4. Define men. Answer. Material living things belonging to the animal kingdom having two hands and two feet, or else animals having two hands and two feet. 5. Define London. Answer. The material artificial thing which consists of houses and streets and has four million inhabitants, or else the town which has four million inhabitants. Note that we here use the article the instead of a because we happen to know that there is only one such thing. The reader can set himself any number of examples of this process by simply choosing the name of any common thing such as house, tree, knife, making a definition for it and then testing his answer by referring to any English dictionary. The end of chapter 5. Book 2 Propositions. Chapter 1. Propositions Generally. Introductory. Note that the word some is to be regarded henceforward as meaning one or more. The word proposition, as used in ordinary conversation, may be applied to any word or phrase which conveys any information whatever. Thus the words yes and no are propositions in the ordinary sense of the word, and so are the phrases, you owe me five farthings, and I don't. Such words as, oh, or never, and such phrases as, fetch me that book, which book do you mean, do not seem at first sight to convey any information, but they can easily be turned into equivalent forms which do so. Namely, I am surprised, I will never consent to it, I order you to fetch me that book, I want to know which book you mean. But a proposition, as used in this first part of symbolic logic, 
has a peculiar form which may be called its normal form, and if any proposition which we wish to use in an argument is not in normal form, we must reduce it to such a form before we can use it. A proposition, when in normal form, asserts as to certain two classes which are called its subject and predicate, either 1. that some members of its subject are members of its predicate, or 2. that no members of its subject are members of its predicate, or 3. that all members of its subject are members of its predicate. The subject and the predicate of a proposition are called its terms. Two propositions which convey the same information are said to be equivalent. Thus, the two propositions, I see John and John is seen by me, are equivalent. Normal form of a proposition. A proposition in normal form consists of four parts, namely, the word some, or no, or all. This word, which tells us how many members of the subject are also members of the predicate, is called the sign of quantity. 2. The name of subject. 3. The verb are or is. This is called the copula. 4. The name of the predicate. Various kinds of propositions. A proposition that begins with some is said to be particular. It is also called a proposition in I. Note that it is called particular because it refers to a part only of the subject. A proposition that begins with no is said to be universal negative. It is also called a proposition in E. A proposition that begins with all is said to be universal affirmative. It is also called a proposition in A. Note that they are called universal because they refer to the whole of the subject. A proposition whose subject is an individual is to be regarded as universal. Let us take as an example the proposition, John is not well. This of course implies that there is an individual to whom the speaker refers when he mentions John, and whom the listener knows to be referred to. Hence the class, men, referred to by the speaker when he mentions John, is a one-member class, and the proposition is equivalent to all the men who are referred to by the speaker when he mentions John are not well. Propositions are of two kinds, propositions of existence and propositions of relation. These shall be discussed separately. The end of chapter 1. Chapter 2. Propositions of Existence. A proposition of existence, when in normal form, has for its subject the class existing things. Its sign of quantity is some or no. Note that though its sign of quantity tells us how many existing things are members of its predicate, it does not tell us the exact number. In fact, it only deals with two numbers, which are, in ascending order, zero and one or more. It is called a proposition of existence because its effect is to assert the reality, that is, the real existence, or else the imaginariness of its predicate. Thus the proposition some existing things are honest men, asserts that the class honest men is real. This is the normal form, but it may also be expressed in any one of the following forms. 1. Honest men exist. 2. Some honest men exist. 3. The class honest men exists. 4. There are honest men. 5. There are some honest men. Similarly, the proposition, no existing things are men 50 feet high, asserts that the class, men 50 feet high, is imaginary. This is the normal form, but it may also be expressed in any one of the following forms. 1. Men 50 feet high do not exist. 2. No men 50 feet high exist. 3. The class, men 50 feet high, does not exist. 4. There are not any men 50 feet high. 5. There are no men 50 feet high. The end of chapter 2. Chapter 3. Propositions of Relation. 1. Introductory. A proposition of relation of the kind to be here discussed has for its two terms 
two species of the same genus, such that each of the two names conveys the idea of some attribute not conveyed by the other. Thus, the proposition, some merchants are misers, is of the right kind, since merchants and misers are species of the same genus men, and since the name merchants conveys the idea of the attribute mercantile, and the name misers the idea of the attribute miserly, each of which ideas is not conveyed by the other name. But the proposition, some dogs are setters, is not of the right kind, since, although it is true that dogs and setters are species of the same genus animals, it is not true that the name dogs conveys the idea of any attribute not conveyed by the name setters. Such propositions will be discussed in Part 2. The genus of which the two terms are species is called the universe of discourse, or more briefly, the univ. The sign of quantity is some, or no, or all. Note that though its sign of quantity tells us how many members of its subject are also members of its predicate, it does not tell us the exact number. In fact, it only deals with three numbers which are, in ascending order, zero, one, or more the total number of members of the subject. It is called a proposition of relation because its effect is to assert that a certain relationship exists between its terms. 2. Reduction of a proposition of relation to normal form. The rules for doing this are as follows. 1. Ascertain what is the subject, that is, ascertain what class we are talking about. 2. If the verb governed by the subject is not the verb are, or is, substitute for it a phrase beginning with are or is. 3. Ascertain what is the predicate, that is, ascertain what class it is, which is asserted to contain some, or none, or all of the members of the subject. 4. If the name of each term is completely expressed, that is, if it contains a substantive, there is no need to determine the univ, but if either name is incompletely expressed and contains attributes only, it is then necessary to determine a univ in order to insert its name as the substantive. 5. Ascertain the sign of quantity. 6. Arrange in the following order, sign of quantity, subject, copula, predicate. Let us work a few examples to illustrate these rules. 1. Some apples are not ripe. The subject is apples, 2. The verb is are, 3. The predicate is not ripe, as no substantive is expressed and we have not yet settled what the univ is to be, we are forced to leave a blank, 4. Let univ be fruit, 5. The sign of quantity is some, 6. The proposition now becomes some apples are not ripe fruit. 2. None of my speculations have brought me as much as 5%. 1. The subject is my speculations. 2. The verb is have brought, for which we substitute the phrase are that have brought. 3. The predicate is that have brought, etc. 4. Let univ be transactions. 5. The sign of quantity is none of. 6. The proposition now becomes none of my speculations are transactions that have brought me as much as 5%. 3. None but the brave deserve the fair. To begin with, we note that the phrase none but the brave is equivalent to no, not brave. 1. The subject has for its attribute not brave but no substantive is supplied, so we express the subject as not brave. 2. The verb is deserve, for which we substitute the phrase are deserving of. 3. The predicate is deserving of the fair. 4. Let univ be persons. 5. The sign of quantity is no. 6. The proposition now becomes no not brave persons are persons deserving of the fair. 4. A lame puppy would not say thank you if you offered to lend it a skipping rope. 
one. The subject is evidently lame puppies, and all the rest of the sentence must somehow be packed into the predicate. Two, the verb is would not say, and so forth, for which we may substitute the phrase are not grateful for. Three, the predicate may be expressed as not grateful for the loan of a skipping rope. Four, let Univ be puppies. Five, the sign of quantity is all. The proposition now becomes all, lame puppies, are, puppies not grateful for the loan of a skipping rope. 5. No one takes in the times unless he is well educated. 1. The subject is evidently persons who are not well educated. No one evidently means no person. 2. The verb is take in, for which we may substitute the phrase are persons taking in. 3. The predicate is persons taking in the times. 4. Let univ be persons. 5. The sign of quantity is no. 6. The proposition now becomes no. Persons who are not well educated are persons taking in the times. 6. My carriage will meet you at the station. 1. The subject is my carriage. This being an individual is equivalent to the class my carriages. Note that this class contains only one member. 2. The verb is will meet, for which we may substitute the phrase are that will meet. 3. The predicate is that will meet you at the station. 4. Let univ be things. 5. The sign of quantity is all. 6. The proposition now becomes all my carriages are things that will meet you at the station. 7. Happy is the man who does not know what toothache means. 1. The subject is evidently the man and so forth. Note that in this sentence, the predicate comes first. At first sight, the subject seems to be an individual, but on further consideration, we see that the article the does not imply that there is only one such man. Hence, the phrase the man is equivalent to all men who. 2. The verb is are. 3. The predicate is happy. 4. Let univ be men. 5. The sign of quantity is all. 6. The proposition now becomes all men who do not know what toothache means are happy men. 8. Some farmers always grumble at the weather, whatever it may be. 1. The subject is farmers. 2. The verb is grumble, for which we substitute the phrase are who grumble. 3. The predicate is who always grumble, etc. 4. Let univ be persons. 5. The sign of quantity is some. 6. The proposition now becomes some farmers are persons who always grumble at the weather, whatever it may be. 9. No lambs are accustomed to smoke cigars. 1. The subject is lambs. 2. The verb is are. 3. The predicate is accustomed and so forth. 4. Let univ be animals. 5. The sign of quantity is no. 6. The proposition now becomes no. Lambs are animals accustomed to smoke cigars. 10. I cannot understand examples that are not arranged in regular order like those I am used to. 1. The subject is examples that, etc. 2. The verb is I cannot understand, which we must alter so as to have examples, instead of I as the nominative case, 
It may be expressed as are not understood by me. 3. The predicate is not understood by me. 4. Let univ be examples. 5. The sign of quantity is all. 6. The proposition now becomes all. Examples that are not arranged in regular order like those I am used to are examples not understood by me. 3. A proposition of relation beginning with all is a double proposition. A proposition of relation beginning with all asserts, as we already know, that all members of the subject are members of the predicate. This evidently contains, as a part of what it tells us, the smaller proposition, some members of the subject are members of the predicate. Thus, the proposition, all bankers are rich men, evidently contains the smaller proposition, some bankers are rich men. The question now arises, what is the rest of the information which this proposition gives us? In order to answer this question, let us begin with the smaller proposition, some members of the subject are members of the predicate. And suppose that this is all we have been told, and let us proceed to inquire what else we need to be told in order to know that all members of the subject are members of the predicate. Thus we may suppose that the proposition, some bankers are rich men, is all the information we possess, and we may proceed to inquire what other proposition needs to be added to it in order to make up the entire proposition, all bankers are rich men. Let us also suppose that the univ, that is, the genus of which both the subject and the predicate are species, has been divided by the process of dichotomy into two smaller classes, namely, 1. The predicate, 2. The class whose differentia is contradictory to that of the predicate. Thus we may suppose that the genus men, of which both bankers and rich men are species, have been divided into the two smaller classes, rich men, poor men. Now, we know that every member of the subject is, as shown at page 6, a member of the univ. Hence, every member of the subject is either in class 1 or else in class 2. Thus, we know that every banker is a member of the genus men. Hence, every banker is either in the class rich men or else in the class poor men. Also, we have been told that in the case we are discussing, some members of the subject are in class 1. What else do we need to be told in order to know that all of them are there? Evidently, we need to be told that none of them are in class 2. That is, that none of them are members of the class whose differentia is contradictory to that of the predicate. Thus, we may suppose we have been told that some bankers are in the class rich men. What else do we need to be told in order to know that all of them are there? Evidently, we need to be told that none of them are in the class poor men. Hence, a proposition of relation beginning with all is a double proposition and is equivalent to, that is, gives the same information as, the two propositions. 1. Some members of the subject are members of the predicate. 2. No members of the subject are members of the class whose differentia is contradictory to that of the predicate. Thus, the proposition all bankers are rich men is double proposition and is equivalent to the two propositions some bankers are rich men no bankers are rich men. 4. What is implied in a proposition of relation as to the reality of its terms? Note that the rules here laid down are arbitrary and only applied to part one of my symbolic logic. A proposition of relation beginning with some is henceforward to be understood as asserting that there are some existing things which, being members of the subject, are also members of the predicate, that is, that some existing things are members of both terms at once. Hence, it is to be understood as implying that each term, taken by itself, is real. Thus, the proposition, some rich men are invalids, is to be understood as asserting that some existing things are rich invalids. Hence, it implies that each of the two classes, rich men and invalids, taken by itself, is real. A proposition of relation, beginning with no, is henceforward to be understood as asserting that there are no existing things which, being members of the subject, are also members of the predicate, that is, that no existing things are members of both terms at once. But this implies nothing as to the reality of either term taken by itself. Thus the proposition, no mermaids are milliners, 
is to be understood as asserting that no existing things are mermaid milliners. But this implies nothing as to the reality or the unreality of either of the two classes, mermaids and milliners, taken by itself. In this case, as it happens, the subject is imaginary and the predicate real. A proposition of relation beginning with all contains a similar proposition beginning with some, hence it is to be understood as implying that each term taken by itself is real. Thus, the proposition, all hyenas are savage animals, contains the proposition, some hyenas are savage animals. Hence, it implies that each of the two classes, hyena and savage animals, taken by itself, is real. 5. Translation of a proposition of relation into one or more propositions of existence. We have seen that a proposition of relation, beginning with some, asserts that some existing things, being members of its subject, are also members of its predicate. Hence, it asserts that some existing things are members of both. That is, it asserts that some existing things are members of the class of things which have all the attributes of the subject and the predicate. Hence, to translate it into a proposition of existence, we take existing things as the new subject and things which have all the attributes of the subject and the predicate as the new predicate. Similarly, for a proposition of relation beginning with no, a proposition of relation beginning with all is equivalent to two propositions, one beginning with some and the other with no, each of which we know now how to translate. Let us work a few examples to illustrate these rules. Some apples are not ripe. Here we arrange thus, some, sign of quantity, existing things, the subject, are, the copula, not ripe apples, the predicate, or thus, some, existing things, are, not ripe apples. Two. Some farmers always grumble at the weather, whatever it may be. Here we arrange thus. Some existing things are farmers who always grumble at the weather, whatever it may be. 3. No lambs are accustomed to smoke cigars. Here we arrange thus. No existing things are lambs accustomed to smoke cigars. Four. None of my speculations have brought me as much as 5%. Here we arrange thus. No. Existing things are speculations of mine which have brought me as much as 5%. 5. None but the brave deserve the fair. Here we note to begin with that the phrase none but the brave is equivalent to no, not brave men. We then arrange thus. No. Existing things are not brave men deserving of the fair. 6. All bankers are rich men. This is equivalent to the two propositions some bankers are rich men and no bankers are poor men. Here we arrange thus. Some existing things are rich bankers and no existing things are poor bankers. The end of chapter three. Book three. Editorial note. This book refers to several diagrams and tables which may be found in the accompanying textual version of the book found at the same FCIT website. Chapter 1. Symbols and Cells First, let us suppose that the biliteral diagram is an enclosure assigned to a certain class of things which we have selected as our universe of discourse, or more briefly, as our univ. For example, we might say let univ be books, and we might imagine the biliteral diagram to be a large table assigned to all books. The reader is strongly advised in reading this chapter 
not to refer to the above diagram, but to draw a large one for himself without any letters, and to have it by him while he reads, and keep his finger on that particular part of it about which he is reading. Secondly, let us suppose that we have selected a certain adjunct which we may call X, and have divided the large class to which we have assigned the whole diagram into the two smaller classes whose differentiae are X and not X, which we may call X, and that we have assigned the north half of the diagram to the one which we may call the class of X things, or the X class, and the south half to the other, which we may call the class of X prime things, or the X prime class. For example, we might say, let X mean old, so that X prime will mean new, and we might suppose that we had divided books into the two classes whose differentiae are old and new, and had assigned the north half of the table to old books, and the south half to new books. Thirdly, let us suppose that we have selected another adjunct which we may call Y, and have subdivided the X class into the two classes whose differentiae are Y and Y prime, and that we have assigned the northwest cell to the one which we may call the XY class, and the northeast cell to the other which we may call the XY prime class. For example, we might say, let Y mean English, so that Y prime will mean foreign. And we might suppose that we had subdivided old books into the two classes whose differentiae are English and foreign, and had assigned the northwest cell to old English books and the northeast cell to old foreign books. Fourthly, let us suppose that we have subdivided the X prime class in the same manner, and have assigned the southwest cell to the X prime Y class, and the southeast cell to the X prime Y prime class. For example, we might suppose that we had subdivided new books into the two classes, new English books and new foreign books, and had assigned the southwest cell to the one and the southeast cell to the other. It is evident that if we had begun by dividing for y and y prime, and had then subdivided for x and x prime, we should have got the same four classes. Hence, we see that we have assigned the west half to the y class, and the east half to the y prime class. Thus, in the above example, we should find that we had assigned the west half of the table to English books, and the east half to foreign books. We have, in fact, assigned the four books, quarters of the table, to four different classes of books, as shown in the accompanying table. The reader should carefully remember that in such a phrase as the X things, the word things means that particular kind of things to which the whole diagram has been assembled. Thus, if we say, let univ be books, we mean that we have assigned the whole diagram to books. In that case, if we took X to mean old, the phrase the X things would mean the old books. The reader should not go to the next chapter until he is quite familiar with the blank diagram I have advised him to draw. He ought to be able to name instantly the adjunct assigned to any compartment named in the right-hand column of the accompanying table. Also, he ought to be able to name instantly the compartment assigned to any adjunct named in the left-hand column. To make sure of this, he had better put the book into the hands of some genial friend while he himself has nothing but the blank diagram and get that genial friend to question him on this table, dodging about as much as possible. The questions and answers should be something like this. Editorial note. What follows is table one. The questions immediately following are based on this table, which can be found in the accompanying textual version of this article on the FCIT website. Table 1 Questions Question. Adjunct for west half? Answer. Y. Question. Compartment for XY prime? Answer. Northeast cell. Question. Adjunct for southwest cell? Answer. X prime Y and so on and so forth. After a little practice, he will find himself able to do without the blank diagram and will be able to see it mentally, in my mind's eye, Horatio, while answering the questions of his genial friend. When this result has been reached, he may safely go on to the next chapter. The end of chapter one. Chapter two, counters. Let us agree that a red counter placed within a cell shall mean this cell is occupied, that is, there is at least one thing in it. 
Let us also agree that a red counter placed on the partition between two cells shall mean the compartment made up of these two cells is occupied, but it is not known whereabouts in it its occupants are. Hence, it may be understood to mean at least one of these two cells is occupied. Possibly both are. Our ingenious American cousins have invented a phrase to describe the condition of a man who has not yet made up his mind which of two political parties he will join. Such a man is said to be sitting on the fence. This phrase exactly describes the condition of the red counter. Let us also agree that a gray counter placed within a cell shall mean this cell is empty, that is, there is nothing in it. The reader had better provide himself with four red counters and five gray ones. The end of chapter 2. Chapter 3. Representation of Propositions. Section 1. Introductory. Henceforwards, in stating such propositions as some X things exist or no X things are Y things, I shall admit the word things which the reader can supply for himself and shall write them as some X exist or no X are Y. Note that the word things is here used with a special meaning, as explained at page 23. A proposition containing only one of the letters used as symbols for attributes is said to be unilateral. For example, some X exist, no Y prime exist, etc. A proposition containing two letters is said to be biliteral. For example, some X Y prime exist, no X prime are Y, etc. A proposition is said to be in terms of the letter it contains, whether with or without accents. Thus, some X Y prime exist, no X prime are Y, etc. are said to be in terms of X and Y. Section 2. Representation of Propositions of Existence Let us take first the proposition, some X exist. Note that this proposition is, as explained at page 12, equivalent to some existing things are X things. This tells us that there is at least one thing in the north half, that is, that the north half is occupied, and this we can evidently represent by placing a red counter on the partition which divides the north half. Editorial note. The reader may wish to refer to the accompanying physical diagrams which appear in the textual version of this article on the same FCIT website. In the book's example, this proposition would be some old books exist. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, some X prime exist, some Y exist, and some Y prime exist. The reader should make out all these for himself. In the book's example, these propositions would be some new books exist, and so forth. Let us take next the proposition, no X exist. This tells us that there is nothing in the north half, that is, that the north half is empty, that is, that the northwest cell and the northeast cell are both of them empty. And this we can represent by placing two gray counters in the north half, one in each cell. The reader may perhaps think that it would be enough to place a gray counter on the partition in the north half, and that, just as a red counter so placed, would mean this half is occupied, so a gray one would mean this half is empty. This, however, would be a mistake. We have seen that a red counter so placed would mean at least one of these two cells is occupied. Possibly both are. Hence, a gray one would merely mean at least one of these two cells is empty. Possibly both are. But what we have to represent is that both cells are certainly empty, and this can only be done by placing a gray counter in each of them. In the book's example, this proposition would be, no old books exist. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, no X prime exist, no Y exist, and no Y prime exist. The reader should make out all these for himself in the book's example. These three propositions would be, no new books exist, etc. Let us take next the proposition some XY exist. This tells us that there is at least one thing in the northwest cell, that is, that the northwest cell is occupied, and this we can represent by placing a red counter in it. In the book's example, this proposition would be some old English books exist. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, some XY prime exist, some X prime Y exist, and some 
x prime y prime exist. The reader should make out all these for himself. In the book's example, these three propositions would be some old foreign books exist, and so forth. Let us take next the proposition no x y exist. This tells us that there is nothing in the northwest cell. That is, that the northwest cell is empty, and this we can represent by placing a gray counter in it. In the book's example, this proposition would be, no old English books exist. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, no x y prime exist, no x prime y exist, and no x prime y prime exist. The reader should make out all these for himself. In the book's example, these three propositions would be, no old foreign books exist, etc. We have seen that the proposition, no x exist, may be represented by placing two gray counters in the north half, one in each cell. We have also seen that these two gray counters, taken separately, represent the two propositions, no x y exist, and no x y prime exist. Hence, we see that the proposition no x exist is a double proposition and is equivalent to the two propositions no x y exist and no x y prime exist. In the book's example, this proposition would be no old books exist. Hence, this is a double proposition and is equivalent to the two propositions no old English books exist and no old foreign books exist. Section 3. Representation of Propositions of Relation Let us take first the proposition, some x or y. This tells us that at least one thing in the north half is also in the west half. Hence, it must be in the space common to them, that is, in the northwest cell. Hence, the northwest cell is occupied, and this we can represent by placing a red counter in it. Note that the subject of the proposition settles which half we are to use, and that the predicate settles in which portion of it we are to place the red counter. In the book's example, this proposition would be, some old books are English. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, some x are y prime, some x prime are y, and some x prime are y prime. The reader should make out all these for himself. In the book's example, these three propositions would be, some old books are foreign, and so forth. Let us take next the proposition, some y are x. This tells us that at least one thing in the west half is also in the north half. Hence, it must be in the space common to them, that is, in the northwest cell. Hence, the northwest cell is occupied, and this we can represent by placing a red counter in it. In the book's example, this proposition would be, some English books are old. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, some y are x prime, some y prime are x, and some y prime are x prime. The reader should make out all these for himself. In the book's example, these three propositions would be, some English books are new, and so forth. We see that this one diagram has now served to represent no less than three propositions, namely, 1. Some x, y exist, 2. Some x are y, 3. Some y are x. Hence, these three propositions are equivalent. In the book's example, these propositions would be 1. Some old English books exist 2. Some old books are English 3. Some English books are old The two equivalent propositions, some x are y and some y are x, are said to be converse to each other, and the process of changing one into the other is called converting or conversion. For example, if we were told to convert the proposition, some apples are not ripe, we should first choose our univ, say fruit, and then complete the proposition by supplying the substantive fruit in the predicate, so that it would be, some apples are not ripe fruit, and we should then convert it by interchanging its terms so that it would be, some not ripe fruit are apples. Similarly, we may represent the three similar trios of equivalent propositions the whole set of four trios being as follows. 1. Some x, y exist equals some x or y equals some y or x. 2. Some x, y prime exist equals some x or y prime equals some y prime or x. 3. 
sum x prime y prime exists equals sum x prime or y prime equals sum y prime or x prime. Let us take next the proposition no x or y. This tells us that no thing in the north half is also in the west half. Hence, there is nothing in the space common to them, that is, in the northwest cell. Hence, the northwest cell is empty, and this we can represent by placing a gray counter in it. In the book's example, this proposition would be, no old books are English. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, no x or y prime, and no x prime or y, and no x prime or y prime. The reader should make out all these for himself. In the book's example, these three propositions would be no old books are foreign, and so forth. Let us take next the proposition no y or x. This tells us that no thing in the west half is also in the north half. Hence, there is nothing in the space common to them, that is, in the northwest cell. That is, the northwest cell is empty. And this we can represent by placing a gray counter in it. In the book's example, this proposition would be no English books are old. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, no y or x prime, no y prime or x, and no y prime or x prime. The reader should make out all these for himself. In the book's example, these three propositions would be, no English books are new, and so forth. We see that this one diagram has now served to present no less than three propositions, namely, one, no x, y exist, two, no x or y, 3. No y are x. Hence, these three propositions are equivalent. In the book's example, these three propositions would be 1. No old English books exist. 2. No old books are English. 3. No English books are old. The two equivalent propositions, no x are y and no y are x, are said to be converse to each other. For example, if we were told to convert the proposition, no porcupines are talkative, we should first choose our univ, say animals, and then complete the proposition by supplying the substantive, animals, in the predicate, so that it would be, no porcupines are talkative animals, and we should then convert it by interchanging its terms so that it would be, no talkative animals are porcupines. Similarly, we may represent the three similar trios of equivalent propositions, the whole set of four trios being as follows. 1. No xy exists equals no x or y equals no y or x. 2. No x y prime exists equals no x or y prime equals no y prime or x. 3. No x prime y exists equals no x prime or y equals no y or x prime. 4. No x prime y prime exists equals no x prime or y prime equals no y prime or x prime. Let us take next the proposition all x or y. We know that this is a double proposition and equivalent to the two propositions sum x or y and no x or y, each of which we already know how to represent. Note that the subject of the given proposition settles which half we are to use and that its predicate settles in which portion of that half we are to place the red counter. Editorial note. At this point in the text, Table 2 appears. The listener is referred to the accompanying textual version of this article, which appears on the same FCIT website. Within the table, there are several textual references, including some x exists, no x exists, some x prime exists, no x prime exists, and so forth. Continuing. Similarly, we may represent the seven similar propositions, all x or y prime, all x prime or y, all x prime or y prime, all y or x, all y or x prime, all y prime or x, and all y prime or x prime. Let us take lastly the double proposition sum x or y and sum or y prime, each part of which we already know how to represent. Similarly, we may represent the three similar propositions, sum x prime or y, and sum or y prime, sum y or x, and sum or x prime, sum y prime or x, and sum or x prime. The reader should now get his genial friend to question him severely on these two tables. 
the Inquisitor should have the tables before him, but the victim should have nothing but a blank diagram, and the counters with which he is to represent the various propositions named by his friend. That is, some Y exist, no Y prime are X, all X are Y, and so on and so forth. Editorial note for the listener. At this point in the text, Table 3 appears. The reader is referred to the accompanying textual version of this article, which appears on the same FCIT website. The end of Chapter 3. Chapter 4. Interpretation of Biliteral Diagram when Marked with Counters. The diagram is supposed to be set before us with certain counters placed upon it, and the problem is to find out what proposition or propositions the counters represent. As the process is simply the reverse of that discussed in the previous chapter, we can avail ourselves of the results there obtained as far as they go. First, let us suppose that we find a red counter placed in the northwest cell. We know that this represents each the trio of equivalent propositions. Some x, y exist equals some x or y equals some y or x. Similarly, we may interpret a red counter when placed in the northeast or southwest or southeast cell. Next, let us suppose that we find a gray counter placed in the northwest cell. We know that this represents each of the trio of equivalent propositions no x, y exist, no x or y equals no y or x. Similarly, we may interpret a gray counter when placed in the northeast or southwest or southeast cell. Next, let us suppose that we find a red counter placed on the partition which divides the north half. We know that this represents the proposition some x exists. Similarly, we may interpret a red counter when placed on the partition which divides the south or west or east half. Next, let us suppose that we find two red counters placed in the north half, one in each cell. We know that this represents the double proposition, some x are y and some are y prime. Similarly, we may interpret two red counters when placed in the south or west or east half. Now let us suppose that we find two gray counters placed in the north half, one in each cell. We know that this represents the proposition, no x exist. Similarly, we may interpret two gray counters when placed in the south or west or east half. Lastly, let us suppose that we find a red and a gray counter placed in the north half, the red in the northwest cell, and the gray in the northeast cell. We know that this represents the proposition, all x are y. Note that the half occupied by the two counters settles what is to be the subject of the proposition, and that the cell occupied by the red counter settles what is to be its predicate. Similarly, we may interpret a red and a gray counter when placed in any one of the seven similar positions. Red in northeast, gray in northwest. Red in southwest, gray in southeast. Red in southeast, gray in southwest. Red in northwest, gray in southwest. Red in southwest, gray in northwest. Red in northeast, gray in southeast, red in southeast, gray in northeast. Once more, the genial friend must be appealed to and requested to examine the reader on tables two and three, and to make him not only represent propositions, but also interpret diagrams when marked with counters. The questions and answers should be like this. Question. Represent no x prime or y prime. Answer. Gray counter in southeast cell. Question. Interpret red counter on east partition. Answer. Some y prime exists. Question. Represent all y prime are x. Answer. Red in northeast cell, gray in southeast. Question. Interpret gray counter in southwest cell. Answer. No x prime y exist equal no x prime r y equal no y r x, and so on and so forth. At first, the examinee will need to have the board and counters before him, but he will soon learn to dispense with these and to answer with his eyes shut or gazing into vacancy. The end of chapter 4 and the end of book 3. Book 4. The Triliteral Diagram. Editorial Note. This book and its accompanying chapters rely heavily on the use of diagrams and tables. The reader is referred to the identical article in the accompanying textual version on the same website. Chapter 1. Symbols and Cells. First, 
Let us suppose that the above left-hand diagram is the bilateral diagram that we have been using in Book 3, and that we change it into a trilateral diagram by drawing an inner square so as to divide each of its four cells into two portions, thus making eight cells altogether. The right-hand diagram shows the result. The reader is strongly advised in reading this chapter not to refer to the above diagrams, but to make a large copy of the right-hand one for himself without any letters, and to have it by him while he reads and keep his finger on that particular part of it about which he is reading. Secondly, let us suppose that we have selected a certain adjunct, which we may call M, and have subdivided the XY class into the two classes whose differentiae are M and M prime and that we assign the northwest inner cell to the one which we may call the class of XYM things, or the XYM class, and the northwest outer cell to the other thing which we may call the class of XYM prime things, or the XYM prime class. Thus in the book's example, we might say let M mean bound, so that M prime will mean unbound, and we might suppose that we had subdivided the class Old English Books into the two classes Old English bound books and Old English unbound books, and had assigned the northwest inner cell to the one and the northwest outer cell to the other. Thirdly, let us suppose that we have subdivided the XY prime class, the X prime Y class, and the X prime Y prime class in the same manner, and have in each case assigned the inner cell to the class possessing the attribute M and the outer cell to the class possessing the attribute M prime. Thus, in the book's example, we might suppose that we had subdivided the New English books into the two classes, New English Bound Books and New English Unbound Books, and had assigned the Southwest Inner Cell to the one and the Southwest Outer Cell to the other. It is evident that we have now assigned the Inner Square to the M class and the Outer Border to the M Prime class. Thus, in the book's example, we have assigned the Inner Square to Bound Books and the Outer Border to Unbound Books. When the reader has made himself familiar with this diagram, he ought to be able to find, in a moment, the compartment assigned to a particular pair of attributes or the cell assigned to a particular trio of attributes. The following rules will help him in doing this. 1. Arrange the attributes in the order X, Y, M. 2. Take the first of them and find the compartment assigned to it. 3. Then take the second and find what portion of that compartment is assigned to it. 4. Treat the third, if there is one, in the same way. For example, suppose we have to find the compartment assigned to YM. We say to ourselves, Y has the west half, and M has the inner portion of that west half. Again, suppose we have to find the cell assigned to X prime, Y M prime. We have to say to ourselves, X prime has the south half, Y has the west portion of the south half, that is, has the southwest quarter and M prime has the outer portion of that southwest quarter. The reader should now get his genial friend to question him on the table given on the next page in the style of the following specimen dialogue. Question. Adjunct for south half inner portion? Answer. X prime M. Question. Compartment for M prime? Answer. The outer border. Question. Adjunct for northeast quarter outer portion? Answer. X, Y prime, M. Question. Compartment for Y, M? Answer. West half, inner portion. Question. Adjunct for south half? Answer. X prime. Question. Compartment for X prime, Y prime? Answer. Southeast quarter, inner portion, etc., etc. Editorial note. There now appears in the text, table 4. The reader is referred to the accompanying textual version of this article, which appears on the same FCIT website. The End of Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Representation of Propositions in Terms of X and M or of Y and M Section 1 Representation of Propositions of Existence in Terms of X and M or of Y and M let us take first the proposition, some XM exist. Note that the full meaning of this proposition is, some existing things are XM things. This tells us that there is at least one thing in the inner portion of the north half, that is, that this compartment is occupied, and this we can evidently represent by placing a red counter on the partition which divides it. 
In the books example, this proposition would mean some old bound books exist, or there are some old bound books. Similarly, we may represent the seven similar propositions. Some XM prime exist, some X prime M exist, some X prime M prime exist, some Y M exist, some Y M prime exist, some Y prime M exist, and some Y prime M prime exist. Let us take next the proposition no XM exist. This tells us that there is nothing in the inner portion of the north half, that is, that this compartment is empty. And this we can represent by placing two gray counters in it, one in each cell. Similarly, we may represent the seven similar propositions in terms of X and M, or of Y and M, namely, no X M prime exist, no X prime M exist, and so forth. These 16 propositions of existence are the only ones that we shall have to represent on this diagram. Section 2. Representation of propositions of relation in terms of X and M, or of Y and M. Let us take first the pair of converse propositions, sum XRM equals sum MRX. We know that each of these is equivalent to the proposition of existence, sum XM exist, which we already know how to represent. Similarly, for the seven similar pairs in terms of X and M, or of Y and M, let us take next the pair of converse propositions. No XRM equals no MRX. We know that each of these is equivalent to the proposition of existence, no XM exist, which we already know how to represent. Similarly, for the seven similar pairs in terms of X and M, or of Y and M, let us take next the proposition all XRM. We know that this is a double proposition, and equivalent to the two propositions, some XRM and no XRM prime, each of which we already know how to represent. Similarly, for the 15 similar propositions in terms of X and M, or of Y and M, these 32 propositions of relation are the only ones that we shall have to represent on this diagram. The reader should now get his genial friend to question him on the following four tables. The victim should have nothing before him but a blank, triliteral diagram, a red counter, and two gray ones with which he is to represent the various propositions named by the inquisitor. That is, no Y prime RM, some XM prime exist, and so on and so forth. Editorial note. There follows in the text, Table 5. The listener is referred to the accompanying textual version of this same article, which appears on the FCIT website. The same is true for Tables 6, 7, and 8, which follow. The end of Chapter 2. Chapter 3. Representation of two propositions of relation, one in terms of X and M, and the other in terms of Y and M, on the same diagram. The reader had better now begin to draw little diagrams for himself, and to mark them with the digits 1 and 0, instead of using the board and counters. He may put a 1 to represent a red counter, this may be interpreted to mean there is at least one thing there, and a 0 to represent a gray counter, this may be interpreted to mean there is nothing here. The pair of propositions that we shall have to represent will always be one in terms of X and M, and the other in terms of Y and M. When we have to represent a proposition beginning with all, we break it up into the two propositions to which it is equivalent. When we have to represent on the same diagram propositions of which some begin with some and others with no, we represent the negative ones first. This will sometimes save us from having to put a one on a fence, and afterwards having to shift it into a cell. Let us work a few examples. 1. No X are M prime, no Y prime are M. Let us first represent no X or M. This gives us diagram A. Then, representing no Y prime or M on the same diagram, we get diagram B. Editorial note. Referred to the accompanying textual version of this article on the same FCIT website, to view the specified tables. 2. Some M R X, no M R Y. If neglecting the rule we were to begin with some M R X, we should get diagram A, 
And if we were then to take no MRY, which tells us that the inner northwest cell is empty, we should be obliged to take the 1 off the fence, as it no longer has the choice of two cells, and to put it into the inner northeast cell, as in accompanying diagram C. This trouble may be saved by beginning with no M or Y, as in diagram B. And now, when we take some MRX, there is no fence to sit on. The 1 has to go at once into the northeast cell, as in accompanying diagram C. 3. No X prime or M prime, all M or Y. Here we begin by breaking up the second into the two propositions to which it is equivalent. Thus we have three propositions to represent, namely, 1. No X prime or M prime, 2. Some M or Y, 3. No M or Y. These we will take in the order 1, 3, 2. First, we take number 1, namely, no X prime or M prime. This gives us accompanying diagram A. Adding to this number 3, namely, no M or Y, we get accompanying diagram B. This time, the 1 representing number 2, namely, some M or Y, has to sit on the fence as there is no 0 to order it off. This gives us accompanying diagram C. 4. All M are X, all Y are M. Here we break up both propositions and thus get 4 to represent, namely 1, some M are X, 2, no M are X prime, 3, some Y are M, 4, no Y are M. These we will take in the order 2, 4, 1, 3. First we take number 2, namely no M are X prime. This gives us accompanying diagram A. To this we add number 4, namely, no Y or M prime, and thus get accompanying diagram B. If we were to add to this number 1, namely, some MRX, we should have to put the 1 on a fence. So let us try number 3 instead, namely, some Y or M. This gives us accompanying diagram C. And now, there is no need to trouble about number 1, as it would not add anything to our information to put a 1 on the fence. The diagram already tells us that some M are X. The end of chapter 3. Chapter 4. Interpretation in terms of X and Y of triliteral diagram when marked with counters or digits. Editorial note. This chapter makes reference to several tables and or diagrams. These may be found in the accompanying textual version of the same article on the same FCIT website. The problem before us is, given a marked triliteral diagram, to ascertain what propositions of relation in terms of X and Y are represented on it. The best plan for a beginner is to draw a biliteral diagram alongside of it and to transfer from the one to the other all the information he can. He can then read off from the biliteral diagram the required propositions. After a little practice, he will be able to dispense with the biliteral diagram and to read off the result from the triliteral diagram itself. To transfer the information, observe the following rules. 1. Examine the northwest quarter of the triliteral diagram. 2. If it contains a 1 in either cell, it is certainly occupied, and you may mark the northwest quarter of the biliteral diagram with a 1. 3. If it contains two zeros, one in each cell, it is certainly empty, and you may mark the northwest quarter of the biliteral diagram with a 0. 4. Deal in the same way with the northeast, the southwest, and the southeast quarter. Let us take as examples the results of the four examples worked in the previous chapters. Refer to accompanying diagram 1. In the northwest quarter, only one of the two cells is marked as empty, so we do not know whether the northwest quarter of the biliteral diagram is occupied or empty so we cannot mark it. In the northeast quarter, we find two zeros, so this quarter is certainly empty, and we mark it so on the biliteral diagram. 
In the southwest quarter, we have no information at all. In the southeast quarter, we have not enough to use. We may read off the result as no x r y or no y r x, whichever we prefer. Refer to accompanying diagram 2. In the northwest quarter, we have not enough information to use. In the northeast quarter, we find a 1. This shows us that it is occupied, so we may mark the northeast quarter on the bilateral diagram with a 1. In the southwest quarter, we have not enough information to use. In the southeast quarter, we have none at all. We may read off the result as some x or y prime or some y prime or x, whichever we prefer. Refer to accompanying diagram 3. In the northwest quarter, we have no information. The one sitting on the fence is of no use to us until we know on which side he means to jump down. In the northeast quarter, we have not enough information to use. Neither have we in the southwest quarter. The southeast quarter is the only one that yields enough information to use. It is certainly empty, so we mark it as such on the bilateral diagram. We may read off the results as no x prime or y prime or no y prime or x prime, whichever we prefer. Refer to accompanying diagram 4. The northwest quarter is occupied in spite of the zero in the outer cell, so we mark it with a 1 on the bilateral diagram. The northeast quarter yields no information. The southwest quarter is certainly empty, so we mark it as such on the bilateral diagram. The southeast quarter does not yield enough information to use. We read of the result as all y r x. The end of Book 4, Chapter 4. Book 5. Syllogisms. Chapter 1. Introductory. When a trio of biliteral propositions of relation is such that, 1. All their six terms are species of the same genus. 2. Every two of them contained between them a pair of co-divisional classes. 3. The three propositions are so related that if the first two were true, the third would be true. The trio is called a syllogism. The genus of which each of the six terms is a species is called its universe of discourse or more briefly, its unit. The first two propositions are called its premises, and the third its conclusion. Also, the pair of co-divisional terms in the premises are called its eliminands, and the other two its retinands. The conclusion of a syllogism is said to be consequent from its premises. Hence, it is usual to prefix it to the word therefore. Note that the eliminands are so called because they are eliminated and do not appear in the conclusion, and that the retinands are so called because they are retained and do so appear in the conclusion. Note also that the question whether the conclusion is or is not consequent from its premises is not affected by the actual truth or falsity of any of the trio, but depends entirely on their relationship to each other. As a specimen syllogism, let us take the trio no x things are m things, no y things are m prime things, no x things are y things, which we may write as explained thus, no x are m, no y are m prime, no x are y. Here the first and second contain the pair of co-divisional classes m and m prime. The first and third contain the pair x and x, and the second and third contain the pair y and why. Also, the three propositions are, as we shall see hereafter, so related that, if the first two were true, the third will also be true. Hence, the trio is a syllogism. The two propositions, no x r m and no y r m prime, are its premises. The proposition, no x r y, is its conclusion. The terms m and m prime are its eliminands and the term x and y are its retinands. Hence, we may write it thus. No x r m, no y r m prime, therefore, no x r y. As a second specimen, let us take the trio, all cats understand French, 
Some chickens are cats. Some chickens understand French. These put into normal form are, all cats are creatures understanding French. Some chickens are cats. Some chickens are creatures understanding French. Here, all the six terms are species of the genus creatures. Also, the first and second propositions contain the pair of co-divisional classes, cats, and cats. The first and third contain the pair creatures understanding French and creatures understanding French, and the second and third contain the pair chickens and chickens. Also, the three propositions are, as we shall see at page 64, so related that if the first two were true, the third would be true. The first two are, as it happens, not strictly true in our planet, but there is nothing to hinder them from being true in some other planet, say Mars or Jupiter, in which case the third would also be true in that planet, and its inhabitants would probably engage chickens as nursery governesses. They would thus secure a singular contingent privilege unknown in England, namely, that they would be able, at any time when provisions ran short, to utilize the nursery governess for the nursery dinner. Hence the trio is a syllogism. The genus creature is its univ, the two propositions, all cats understand French, and some chickens are cats, are its premises. The proposition, some chickens understand French, is its conclusion. The term cats and cats are its eliminands, and the terms creatures understanding French and chickens are its retinands. Hence we may write it thus. All cats understand French. Some chickens are cats, therefore, some chickens understand French. The end of chapter 1. Chapter 2. Problems in Syllogisms. Section 1. Introductory. When the terms of a proposition are represented by words, it is said to be concrete, when by letters, abstract. To translate a proposition from concrete into abstract form, we fix on a univ and regard each term as a species of it, and we choose a letter to represent its differentia. For example, suppose we wish to translate some soldiers are brave into abstract form. We may take men as univ and regard soldiers and brave men as species of the genus men, and we may choose x to represent the peculiar attribute, say military, of soldiers, and y to represent brave. Then the proposition may be written some military men are brave men, that is, some X-men are Y-men, that is, omitting men as explained at page 26, some X are Y. In practice, we should merely say, let univ be men, X equals soldiers, Y equals brave, and at once translate some soldiers are brave into some X are Y. The problems we shall have to solve are of two kinds, namely, 1. Given a pair of propositions of relation which contain between them a pair of co-divisional classes, and which are proposed as premises, to ascertain what conclusion of any is consequent from them. 2. Given a trio of propositions of relation of which every two contain a pair of co-divisional classes, and which are proposed as a syllogism, to ascertain whether the proposed conclusion is consequent from the proposed premises, and if so, whether it is complete. These problems we will discuss separately. Section 2. Given a pair of propositions of relation which contain between them a pair of co-divisional classes, and which are proposed as premises, to ascertain what conclusion, if any, is consequent from them. The rules for doing this are as follows. 1. Determine the universe of discourse. 2. Construct a dictionary, making M and M, or M and M prime, represent the pair of co-divisional classes, and X, or X prime and Y, or Y prime, the other two. 3. Translate the proposed premises into abstract form. 4. Represent them together on a triliteral diagram. 5. Ascertain what proposition, if any, in terms of X and Y, is also represented on it. 6. Translate this into concrete form. It is evident that, if the proposed premises were true, this other proposition would also be true. Hence, it is a conclusion consequent from the proposed premises. Let us work some examples. 1. No son of mine is dishonest. People always treat an honest man with respect. Taking men as univ, we may write these as follows. No sons of mine are dishonest men. 
all honest men are men treated with respect. We can now construct out of dictionary, namely M equals honest, X equals sons of mine, Y equals treated with respect. Note that the expression X equals sons of mine is an abbreviated form of X equals the differentia of sons of mine when regarded as a species of men. The next thing is to translate the proposed premises into abstract form as follows. No X or M prime, all M or Y. Next, by the process described at page 50, we represent these on a triliteral diagram thus. Editorial note. There follows a series of diagrams in this text. Please refer to the accompanying textual version of this article on the same FCIT website. Next, by the process described earlier, we transfer to a bi-literal diagram all the information we can. The result we read as no x or y, or as no y prime or x, whichever we prefer. So, we refer to our dictionary to see which will look best, and we choose no x or y, which, translated into concrete form, is no son of mine fails to be treated with respect. 2. All cats understand French. Some chickens are cats. Taking creatures as univ, we write these as follows. All cats are creatures understanding French. Some chickens are cats. We can now construct our dictionary, namely M equals cats, X equal understanding French, Y equals chickens. The proposed premises translated into abstract form are all M are X, some Y are M. In order to represent these on a triliteral diagram, we break up the first into the two propositions to which it is equivalent, and thus get the three propositions, one, some M are X, two, no M are X prime, three, some Y are M. The rule given at page 50 would make us take these in the order two, one, three. This, however, would produce the result as described in the accompanying diagram. So, it would be better to take them in the order 2, 3, 1. Numbers 2 and 3 give us the result shown in the accompanying diagram. And now, we need not trouble about number 1, as the proposition, sum MRX, is already represented on the diagram. Transferring our information to a bilateral diagram, we get what is pictured in the accompanying diagram. This result, we can read either as sum X or Y, or sum Y or X. After consulting our dictionary, we choose some Y or X, which, translated into concrete form, is some chickens understand French. 3. All diligent students are successful. All ignorant students are successful. Let Univ be students. M equals successful. X equals diligent. Y equals ignorant. These premises in abstract form are... All X are M, all Y are M prime. These broken up give us the four propositions. 1. Some X are M. 2. No X are M prime. 3. Some Y are M prime. 4. No Y are M, which we will take in the order 2, 4, 1, 3. Representing these on a triliteral diagram, we get what is depicted in the accompanying diagram. And this information, transferred to a biliteral diagram, is pictured in the accompanying diagram. Here we get two conclusions, namely, all X are Y prime, all Y are X prime. And these translated into concrete form are, all diligent students are, not ignorant that is, learned. All ignorant students are, not diligent that is, idle. Four. Of the prisoners who were put on their trial at the last assizes, all against whom the verdict guilty was returned were sentenced to imprisonment. Some who were sentenced to imprisonment were also sentenced to hard labor. Let Univ be the prisoners who were put on their trial at the last assizes. M equal who were sentenced to imprisonment. X equals against whom the verdict guilty was returned. Y equals who were sentenced to hard labor. The premises translated into abstract form are all X are M, some M are Y. Breaking up the first, we get the three, one, some X are M, two, 
no x or m prime, 3, sum m or y. Representing these in the order 2, 1, 3 on a trilateral diagram, we get what is depicted in the accompanying diagram. Here, we get no conclusion at all. You would very likely have guessed, if you had seen only the premises, that the conclusion would be, some against whom the verdict guilty was returned were sentenced to hard labor. But this conclusion is not even true with regard to the assizes I have here invented. Not true, you exclaim? Then who were they who were sentenced to imprisonment and were also sentenced to hard labor? They must have had the verdict guilty returned against them, or how could they be sentenced? Well, it happens like this, you see. They were three ruffians who had committed highway robbery. When they were put on their trial, they pleaded guilty, so no verdict was returned at all, and they were sentenced at once. I will now work out, in their briefest form, as models for the reader to imitate in working examples, the above four concrete problems. 1. No son of mine is dishonest. People always treat an honest man with respect. Univ, men, m equal honest, x equal my sons, y equals treated with respect. That is, no son of mine ever fails to be treated with respect. 2. All cats understand French. Some chickens are cats. Univ, creatures. M equal cats, x equal understanding French, y equals chickens. Some M are X, some Y are M, some Y are X. That is, some chickens understand French. 3. All diligent students are successful. All ignorant students are unsuccessful. Univ students, M equals successful, X equal diligent, Y equals ignorant. All X are M, all Y are M prime. Therefore, all X are Y prime, all Y are X prime. That is, all diligent students are learned, and all ignorant students are idle. 4. Of the prisoners who were put on their trial at the last assizes, all against whom the verdict guilty was returned were sentenced to imprisonment. Some who were sentenced to imprisonment were also sentenced to hard labor. Univ prisoners who were put on their trial at the last assizes, M equals sentence to imprisonment, X equals against whom the verdict guilty was returned, Y equals sentence to hard labor. All X are M, some M are Y, there is no conclusion. Section 3. Given a trio of propositions of relation of which every two contain a pair of codivisional classes and which are proposed as a syllogism, to ascertain whether the proposed conclusion is consequent from the proposed premises, and if so, whether it is complete. The rules for doing this are as follows. Take the proposed premises and ascertain, by the process described at page 60, what conclusion, if any, is consequent from them. 2. If there be no conclusion, say so. 3. If there be a conclusion, compare it with the proposed conclusion and pronounce accordingly. I will now work out in their briefest form as models for the reader to imitate in working examples six problems. 1. All soldiers are strong. All soldiers are brave. Some strong men are brave. Univ, men, m equals soldiers, x equals strong, y equals brave. All m are x, all m are y, some x are y. Therefore, some x are y. Hence, proposed, conclusion is right. 2. I admire these pictures. When I admire anything, I wish to examine it thoroughly. I wish to examine some of these pictures thoroughly. Univ, things, m equal admired by me, x equal these pictures, y equal things which I wish to examine thoroughly. All x are m. All m are y. Some x are y. Therefore, all x are y. Hence, proposed conclusion is incomplete, the complete one being, I wish to examine all these pictures thoroughly. 3. None but the brave deserve the fair. Some braggarts are cowards. Some braggarts do not deserve the fair. Univ, persons, m equal brave, x equal deserving of the fair, y equals braggarts. No m prime are x. Some y are m prime. Some y are x prime. Therefore, some y are x prime. 
hence proposed conclusion is right. 4. All soldiers can march. Some babies are not soldiers. Some babies cannot march. Unit of persons, m equals soldiers, x equal able to march, y equals babies. All m are x, some y are m prime, some y are x prime. There is no conclusion. 5. All selfish men are unpopular. All obliging men are popular. All obliging men are unselfish. Unit of men, m equal popular, x equals selfish, y equals obliging. All x are m prime, all y are m, all y are x prime. Therefore, all x are y prime, all y are x prime. Hence, proposed conclusion is incomplete. The complete one containing, in addition, all selfish men are disobliging. 6. No one who means to go by the train and cannot get a conveyance and has not enough time to walk to the station can do without running. This party of tourists mean to go by the train and cannot get a conveyance, but they have plenty of time to walk to the station. This party of tourists need not run. Univ. Persons meaning to go by the train and unable to get a conveyance. M. Equal having enough time to walk to the station. X. Equal needing to run. Y. Equal these tourists. No M prime or X prime. All Y or M. All Y or X prime. There is no conclusion. Here is another opportunity, gentle reader, for playing a trick on your innocent friend. Put the proposed syllogism before him and ask him what he thinks of the conclusion. He will reply why it's perfectly correct, of course, and if your precious logic book tells you it isn't, don't believe it. You don't mean to tell me those tourists need to run. If I were one of them and knew the premises to be true, I should be quite clear that I needn't run and I should walk. And you will reply, but suppose there was a mad bull behind you. And then your innocent friend will say, Hum, ha, I must think that over a bit. You may then explain to him, as a convenient test of the soundness of a syllogism, that if circumstances can be invented which, without interfering with the truth of the premises, would make the conclusion false, the syllogism must be unsound. The end of Chapter 2 and Book 5 Book 6. The Method of Subscripts. Chapter 1. Introductory. Let us agree that x sub 1 shall mean some existing things have the attribute x, that is, more briefly, some x exist. Also, that x y sub 1 shall mean some x y exist, and so on. Such a proposition may be called an entity. Note that when there are two letters in the expression, it does not in the least matter which stands first xy sub 1 and yx sub 1 mean exactly the same. Also, that x sub 0 shall mean no existing things have the attribute x, that is, more briefly, no x exist. Also, that xy sub 0 shall mean no xy exist, and so on. Such a proposition may be called a nullity. Also, that a dagger symbol shall mean and. Thus, ab sub 1 dagger symbol CD sub zero means some AB exist and no CD exist. Also that the symbol known as a pilcrow shall mean would if true prove. Thus X subscript zero would if true prove XY subscript zero means the proposition no X exist would if true prove proposition no XY exist. When two letters are both of them accented, or both not accented, they are said to have like signs, or to be like. When one is accented and the other not, they are said to have unlike signs, or to be unlike. The end of chapter 1. Chapter 2. Representation of Propositions of Relation. Let us take first the proposition some x are y. This, we know, is equivalent to the proposition of existence some xy exists. Hence, it may be represented by the expression xy sub 1. The converse proposition, some y are x, may of course be represented by the same expression, namely xy sub 1. Similarly, we may represent the three similar pairs of converse proportions, namely some x are y equals some y are x, some x prime are y equals some y are x prime, some x prime or y equals some y prime or x. 
Let us take next the proposition no x or y. This we know is equivalent to the proposition of existence no x, y exist. Hence it may be represented by the expression x, y sub zero. The converse proposition no y or x may of course be represented by the same expression, namely x, y sub zero. Similarly, we may represent the three similar pairs of converse proportions, namely no x or y prime equals no y prime or x, no x prime or y equals no y or x prime, no x prime or y prime equals no y prime or x prime. Let us take next the proposition all x or y. Now, it is evident that the double proposition of existence, some x exist and no x y prime exist, tells us that some x things exist, but that none of them have the attribute y prime. That is, it tells us that all of them have the attribute y. That is, it tells us that all x are y. Also, it is evident that the expression x sub 1 and x y prime sub 0 represent this double proposition. Hence, it also represents the proposition all x are y. The reader will perhaps be puzzled by the statement that the proposition all x are y is equivalent to the double proposition some x exist and no x y prime exists, remembering that it was stated at page 33 to be equivalent to the double proposition some x are y and no x are y, that is, some x y exist and no x y prime exist. The explanation is that the proposition some x y exist contains superfluous information. Some x exist is enough for our purpose. This expression may be written in a shorter form, x sub 1 y prime sub 0, since each subscript takes effect back to the beginning of the expression. Similarly, we may represent the seven similar propositions, all x are y prime, all x prime are y, all x prime are y prime, all y x, all y r x, all y prime are x, and all y prime are x prime. The reader should make out all these for himself. It will be convenient to remember that in translating propositions, beginning with all from abstract form into subscript form, or vice versa, the predicate changes sign, that is, changes from positive to negative, or else for negative to positive. Thus the proposition all y or x becomes y sub 1 x sub 0, where the predicate changes from x prime to x. Again, the expression x prime sub 1, y prime sub 0, becomes all x prime or y, where the predicate changes for y prime to y. The end of chapter 2. Chapter 3. Syllogisms. Section 1. Representation of syllogisms. We already know how to represent each of the three propositions of a syllogism in subscript form. When that is done, all we need besides is to write the three expressions in a row with the dagger symbol for and between the premises and the pilcrow symbol before the conclusion. Thus, the syllogism no x are m prime, all m are y, therefore no x are y prime, may be represented thus x m prime sub zero dagger m sub one y prime sub zero pilcrow x y prime sub zero. When a proposition has to be translated from concrete form into subscript form, the reader will find it convenient, just at first, to translate it into abstract form and thence into subscript form. But after a little practice, he will find it quite easy to go straight from concrete form to subscript form. Section 2. Formulae for Solving Problems in Syllogisms when once we have found, by diagrams, the conclusion to a given pair of premises and have represented the syllogism in subscript form, we have a formula by which we can at once find, without having to use diagrams again, the conclusion to any other pair of premises having the same subscript forms. Thus the expression xm sub zero and ym prime sub zero would, if true, prove xy sub zero is a formula by which we can find the conclusion to any pair of premises whose subscript forms are xm sub zero and ym prime sub zero. For example, suppose we had the pair of propositions, no gluttons are healthy, no unhealthy men are strong, proposed at premises, taking men as our universe and making m equal healthy, x equal gluttons, y equal strong, 
we might translate the pair into abstract form thus. No X or M, no M prime or Y. These in subscript form would be MN sub zero and M prime Y sub zero, which are identical with those in our formula. Hence we at once know the conclusion to be X Y sub zero. That is, in abstract form, no X or Y. That is, in concrete form, no gluttons are strong. I shall now take three different forms of pairs of premises and work out their conclusions, once for all, by diagrams, and thus obtain some useful formula. I shall call them Figure 1, Figure 2, and Figure 3. Figure 1 includes any pair of premises, which are both of them nullities, and which contain unlike eliminands. Please refer to the accompanying text of the same article on this website for a view of the diagrams. In the case of diagram 1, we see that the conclusion is a nullity and that the retinends have kept their signs, and we should find this rule to hold good with any pair of premises which fulfill the given conditions. The reader had better satisfy himself of this by working out on diagrams several varieties such as m sub 1, x sub 0, and y m prime sub 0, which would, if true, prove x y sub 0. X M prime sub zero and M sub one Y sub zero, which would if true prove X Y sub zero. X prime M sub zero and Y M prime sub zero, which would if true prove X prime Y sub zero. M prime sub one X prime sub zero and M sub one Y prime sub zero which would have true prove x prime y prime sub zero. If either retinend is asserted in the premises to exist of course, it may be so asserted in the conclusion. Hence we get two variants of figure one, namely where one retinend is so asserted, b where both are so asserted. The reader had better work out on diagrams examples of these two variants such as m sub one x sub zero and y sub 1, m prime sub 0, which proves y sub 1, x sub 0, x sub 1, m prime sub 0, and m sub 1, y sub 0, which proves x sub 1, y sub 0, x prime sub 1, m sub 0, and y sub 1, m prime sub 0, which proves x prime sub 1, y sub 0, plus y sub 1 x prime sub 0. The formula to be remembered is xm sub 0 and ym prime sub 0 would, if true, prove xy sub 0 with the two following rules. 1. Two nullities with unlike eliminands yield a nullity, in which both retinends keep their signs. 2. A retinend asserted in the premises to exist may be so asserted in the conclusion. Note that rule 1 is merely the formula expressed in words. Editorial note. Please refer now to figure 2 included in the accompanying textual version of this article on the same FCIT website. This includes any pair of premises of which one is a nullity and the other an entity and which contain like eliminands. The simplest case is xm sub 0 and ym sub 1, as depicted in the accompanying diagram. In this case, we see that the conclusion is an entity, and that the nullity retinend has changed its sign. And we should find this rule to hold good with any pair of premises which fulfill the given conditions. The reader had better satisfy himself of this by working out on diagrams several varieties, such as x prime m sub 0 and ym sub 1, which would, if true, prove x, y sub 1. x sub 1, m prime sub 0, and y prime m prime sub 1, which would, if true, prove x prime y prime sub 1. m sub 1, x sub 0, and y prime m sub 1, which would, if true, prove x prime y prime sub 1. The formula to be remembered is xm sub 0 and ym sub 1 would, if true, prove 
x prime y sub 1 with the following rule. A nullity and an entity with like eliminands yield an entity in which the nullity retinand changes its sign. Note that this rule is merely the formula expressed in words. Editorial note, please refer for the following to figure 3 in the accompanying textual version of this article on the FCIT website. This includes any pair of premises which are both of them nullities and which contain like eliminands asserted to exist. The simplest case is xm sub 0 and ym sub 0 and m sub 1. Note that m sub 1 is here stated separately because it does not matter in which of the two premises it occurs, so that this includes the three forms of m sub 1, x sub 0, and ym sub 0, xm sub 0, and m sub 1, y sub 0, and m sub 1, x sub 0, and m sub 1, y sub 0. In this case, we see that the conclusion is an entity, and that both retinins have changed their signs. And we should find this rule to hold good with any pair of premises which fulfill the given conditions. The reader had better satisfy himself of this by working out on diagrams several varieties, such as x prime m sub 0 and m sub 1, y sub 0, which would, if true, prove x, y prime sub 1 m prime sub 1 x sub 0 and m prime y prime sub 0 which would if true prove x prime y sub 1 m sub 1 x prime sub 0 and m sub 1 y prime sub 0 which would if true prove x y sub 1 x m sub 0 and y m sub 0 and m sub 1 would if true prove x prime y prime sub 1, with the following rule, which is merely the formula expressed in words. Two nullities, with like eliminands asserted to exist, yield an entity in which both retinands change their signs. In order to help the reader to remember the peculiarities and formula of these three figures, I will put them all together in one table. Editorial note, please refer to Table 9 in the accompanying textual version of this article on the same FCIT website. A nullity and an entity with like eliminands yield an entity in which the nullity retinand changes its sign. Two nullities with like eliminands asserted to exist yield an entity in which both retinands change their signs. I will now work out by these formulae as models for the reader to imitate some problems in syllogisms which have been already worked by diagrams in Book 5, Chapter 2. No son of mine is dishonest. People always treat an honest man with respect. Universe, men, m equals honest, x equal my sons, y equals treated with respect. xm prime sub zero and m sub one y prime sub zero would, if true, prove xy prime sub zero. That is, no son of mine ever fails to be treated with respect. Two. All cats understand French, some chickens are cats. Universe creatures, m equals cats, x equal understanding French, y equals chickens. m sub 1, x prime sub 0, and y m sub 1 would, if true, prove x y sub 1. Some chickens understand French. 3. All diligent students are successful. All ignorant students are unsuccessful. Universe students, m equals successful, x equal diligent, y equal ignorant. x sub 1, m prime sub 0, and y sub 1, m sub 0, would if true prove x sub 1, y sub 0, and y sub 1, x sub 0. All diligent students are learned, and all ignorant students are idle. 4. All soldiers are strong, all soldiers are brave. Some strong men are brave. Universe men, m equals soldiers, x equals strong, y equals brave. m sub 1, x prime sub 0, and m sub 1, y prime sub 0, would, if true, prove x, y sub 1. Hence, proposed conclusion is right. 5. I admire these pictures. 
when I admire anything, I wish to examine it thoroughly. I wish to examine some of these pictures thoroughly. Universe things, m equals admired by me, x equal these, y equal things, which I wish to examine thoroughly. x sub 1, m prime sub 0, and m sub 1, y prime sub 0, would, if true, prove x sub 1, y prime sub 0. Hence, proposed conclusion, x, y sub 1, is incomplete. The complete one being, I wish to examine all these pictures thoroughly. 6. None but the brave deserve the fair. Some braggarts are cowards. Some braggarts do not deserve the fair. Universe persons, m equal brave, x equal deserving of the fair, y equals braggarts. m prime x sub 0 and y m prime sub 1 would, if true, prove x prime y sub 1. Hence, proposed conclusion is right. 7. No one who means to go by the train and cannot get a conveyance and has not enough time to walk to the station can do without running. This party of tourists mean to go by the train and cannot get a conveyance, but they have plenty of time to walk to the station. This party of tourists need not run. Universe. Persons meaning to go by the train and unable to get a conveyance. M equal having enough time to walk to the station. X equal needing to run. Y equal these tourists. M prime X prime sub zero and Y sub one M prime sub zero do not come under any of the three figures. Hence, it is necessary to return to the method of diagrams as shown at page 69. Hence, there is no conclusion. Section three, fallacies. Any argument which deceives us by seeming to prove what it does not really prove may be called a fallacy, derived from the Latin verb fallow, I deceive, but the particular kind to be now discussed consists of a pair of propositions which are proposed as the premises of a syllogism but yield no conclusion. When each of the proposed premises is a proposition in I or E or A, the only kinds with which we are now concerned, the fallacy may be detected by the method of diagrams by simply setting them out on a triliteral diagram and observing that they yield no information which can be transferred to the biliteral diagram. But suppose we were working by the method of subscripts and had to deal with a pair of proposed premises which happened to be a fallacy. How could we be certain that they would not yield any conclusion? Our best plan is, I think, to deal with fallacies in the same way as we have already dealt with syllogisms, that is, to take certain forms of pairs of propositions and to work them out once for all on the triliteral diagram and ascertain that they yield no conclusion, and then to record them for future use as formulae for fallacies, just as we have already recorded our three formulae for syllogisms. Now, if we were to record the two sets of formulae in the same shape, namely by the method of subscripts, there would be considerable risk of confusing the two kinds. Hence, in order to keep them distinct, I propose to record the formulae for fallacies in words and to call them forms instead of formulae. Let us now proceed to find, by the method of diagrams, three forms of fallacies which we will then put on record for future use. They are as follows. 1. Fallacy of like eliminands not asserted to exist. 2. Fallacy of unlike eliminands with an entity premise. 3. Fallacy of two entity premises. These shall be discussed separately, and it will be seen that each fails to yield a conclusion. 1. Fallacy of like eliminands not asserted to exist. It is evident that neither of the given propositions can be an entity, since that kind asserts the existence of both of its terms. Hence, they must both be nullities. Hence, the given pair may be represented by xm sub 0 and ym sub 0, with or without x sub 1, y sub 1. These, set out on triliteral diagrams, are xm sub 0 and ym sub 0, x sub 1, m sub 0 and ym sub 0, xm sub 0 and y sub 1, m sub 0, x sub 1, m sub 0, and y sub 1, m sub 0. Please note the following diagram in the accompanying text on this article at the same FCIT website. 2. 
the fallacy of unlike eliminands and an entity premise. Here the given pair may be represented by xm sub 0 and ym prime sub 1 with or without x sub 1 or m sub 1. These set out on triliteral diagrams are xm sub 0 and ym prime sub 1, x sub 1 m sub 0 and y m prime sub 1, m sub 1 x sub 0 and y m prime sub 1. Please refer to the accompanying diagram in the accompanying textual version of this article on the FCIT website. 3. Fallacy of two entity premises. Here the given pair may be represented by either x m sub 1 and y m sub 1 or xm sub 1 and ym prime sub 1. These set out on tri-literal diagrams are xm sub 1 and ym sub 1, xm sub 1 and ym prime sub 1. Section 4. Method of proceeding with a given pair of propositions. Let us suppose that we have before us a pair of propositions of relation which contain between them a pair of co-divisional classes, and that we wish to ascertain what conclusion, if any, is consequent from them. We translate them, if necessary, into subscript form, and then proceed as follows. 1. We examine their subscripts in order to see whether they are a. a pair of nullities, or b. a nullity and an entity, or c. a pair of entities. 2. If they are a pair of nullities, we examine their eliminands in order to see whether they are unlike or like. If their eliminands are unlike, it is a case of figure 1. We then examine their retinands to see whether one or both of them are asserted to exist. If one retinand is so asserted, it is a case of figure 1a. If both, it's a case of figure 1b. If their eliminands are like, we examine them in order to see whether either of them is asserted to exist. If so, it is a case of figure 3. If not, it is a case of fallacy of like eliminands not asserted to exist. 3. If they are a nullity and an entity, we examine their eliminands in order to see whether they are like or unlike. If their eliminands are like, it is a case of figure 2. If unlike, it is a case of fallacy of unlike eliminands with an entity premise. 4. If they are a pair of entities, it is a case of fallacy by two entity premises. The End of Book 6, Chapter 3 Book 7. Sorites Chapter 1. Introductory When a set of three or more biliteral propositions are such that all their terms are species of the same genus, and are also so related that two of them, taken together, yield a conclusion, which, taken with another of them, yields another conclusion, and so on, until all have been taken, it is evident that, if the original set were true, the last conclusion would also be true. Such a set with the last conclusion tacked on is called a sorites. The original set of propositions is called its premises. Each of the intermediate conclusions is called a partial conclusion of the sorites. The last conclusion is called its complete conclusion, or more briefly, its conclusion, the genus of which all the terms are species, is called its universe of discourse, or more briefly, its univ. The terms used as eliminands in the syllogisms are called its eliminands, and the two terms, which are retained, and therefore appear in the conclusion, are called its retinands. Note that each partial conclusion contains one or two eliminands, but that the complete conclusion contains retinands only. The conclusion is said to be consequent from the premises, for which it is usual to prefix to it the word therefore, or its appropriate symbol. Note that the question whether the conclusion is or is not consequent from the premises is not affected by the actual truth or falsity of any one of the propositions which make up the sorites, but depends entirely on their relationship to one another. As a specimen sorites, let us take the following set of five propositions. No A are B prime, all B are C, all C are D, no E prime are A prime, all H are E. Here the first and second taken together yield no A are C. This taken along with the third yields no A are D. This taken along with the fourth yields no D prime are E prime. 
and this, taken along with the fifth, yields all H are D. Hence, if the original set were true, this would also be true. Hence, the original set with this tacked on is a Sorites. The original set is its premises. The proposition all H are D is its conclusion. The terms A, B, C, E are its eliminands, and the terms D and H are its retinands. Hence, we may write the whole Sorites thus. No A or B prime, all B are C, all C are D, no E prime are A prime, all H are E prime, therefore all H are D. In the above Sorites, the three partial conclusions are the propositions no A are E, no A are D, no D prime are E prime. But if the premises were arranged in other ways, other partial conclusions might be obtained. Thus the order 4, 1, 5, 2, 3 yields the partial conclusions no C prime are B prime, all H are B, all H are C. There are altogether nine partial conclusions to this Sorites, which the reader will find it an interesting task to make out for himself. The end of chapter 1. Chapter 2. Problems in Sorites. Section 1. Introductory. The problems we shall have to solve are of the following form. Given three or more propositions of relation, which are proposed as premises, to ascertain what conclusion, if any, is consequent from them. We will limit ourselves at present to problems which can be worked by the formula of figure 1. Those that require other formula are rather too hard for beginners. Such problems may be solved by either of two methods, namely, 1. The method of separate syllogisms, 2. The method of underscoring. These shall be discussed separately. Section 2. Solution by method of separate syllogisms. The rules for doing this are as follows. 1. Name the universe of discourse. 2. Construct a dictionary making A, B, C, etc. represent the terms. 3. Put the proposed premises into subscript form. 4. Select two which, containing between them a pair of co-divisional classes, can be used as the premises of a syllogism. 5. Find their conclusion by formula. 6. Find a third premise which, along with this conclusion, can be used as the premises of a second syllogism. 7. Find a second conclusion by formula. 8. Proceed thus until all the proposed premises have been used. 9. Put the last conclusion, which is the complete conclusion of the sorites, into concrete form. As an example of this process, let us take as the proposed set of premises. 1. All the policemen on this beat sup with our cook. 2. No man with long hair can fail to be a poet. 3. Amos Judd has never been in prison. 4. Our cook's cousins all love cold mutton. 5. None but policemen on this beat are poets. 6. None but her cousins ever sup with our cook. 7. Men with short hair have all been in prison. Universe men, A equals Amos Judd, B equals cousins of our cook, C equals having been in prison, D equals long-haired, E equals loving cold mutton, H equal poets, K equal policemen on this beat, L equals supping with our cook. We now have to put the proposed premises into subscript form. Let us begin by putting them into abstract form. The result is all K are L, no D are H prime, all A are C prime, all B are E, no K prime are H, no B prime are L, all D prime are C. And it is now easy to put them into subscript form as follows. 1. K sub 1, L prime sub 0. 2. D H prime sub 0. 3. A sub 1, C sub 0. 4. B sub 1, E prime sub 0, 5, K prime, H sub 0, 6, B prime, L sub 0, 7, D prime sub 1, C prime sub 0. We now have to find a pair of premises which will yield a conclusion. Let us begin with number 1 and look down the list till we come to one which we can take along with it so as to form premises belonging to figure 1. We find that number 5 will do, since we can take K as our eliminand, so our first syllogism is 1. K sub 1, L prime sub 0. 5. K 
k prime h sub 0, therefore l prime h sub 0, and so on through 8. We must now begin with l prime h sub 0 and find a premise to go along with it. We find that number 2 will do, h being our eliminand. So our next syllogism is 8 l prime h sub 0, 2, dh prime sub 0, therefore l prime d sub 0, and so forth through 9. We now have used up numbers 1, 5, and 2, and must search among the others for a partner for L prime D sub 0. We find that number 6 will do. So we write 9, L prime D sub 0, 6, B prime L sub 0, therefore DB prime sub 0, and so forth through 10. Now, what can we take along with DB prime sub 0? Number 4 will do. 10, DB prime sub 0, 4, b sub 1 e prime sub 0, therefore d e prime sub 0, and so forth through 11. Along with this, we may take number 7. 11, d e prime sub 0, 7, d prime sub 1, c prime sub 0, therefore e prime c prime sub 0, and so forth through 12. And along with this, we may take number 3. 12, e prime c prime sub 0, 3, a sub 1 c sub 0, therefore a sub 1 c prime sub 0. The complete conclusion translated into abstract form is all a are e, and this translated into concrete form is Amos Judd loves cold mutton. In actually working this problem, the above explanations would of course be omitted, and all that would appear on paper would be as follows. 1. k sub 1 l prime sub 0. 2. dh prime sub 0. 3. a sub 1 c sub 0. 4. b sub 1 e prime sub 0. 5. k prime h sub 0. 6. b prime l sub 0. 7. d prime sub 1 c prime sub 0. Note that in working a sorites by this process, we may begin with any premise we choose. Section 3. Solution by method of underscoring. Consider the pair of premises xm sub 0 and ym prime sub 0, which yield the conclusion xy sub 0. We see that in order to get this conclusion, we must eliminate m and m prime and write x and y together in one expression. Now, if we agree to mark m and m prime as eliminated and to read the two expressions together as if they were written in one, the two premises will then exactly represent the conclusion and we need not write it out separately. Let us agree to mark the eliminated letters by underscoring them, putting a single score under the first and a double one under the second. The two premises now become xm sub zero underscored and ym prime sub zero double underscored which we read as xy sub 0. In copying out the premises for underscoring, it will be convenient to omit all subscripts. As to the zeros, we may always suppose them written, and as to the ones, we are not concerned to know which terms are asserted to exist, except those which appear in the complete conclusion, and for them it will be easy enough to refer to the original list. I will go through the process of solving by this method the example worked in section 2. Editorial note. What follows in this section is a small table, the data of which are contained in the accompanying textual version of this article on the same FCIT website. The listener is referred to that table to work out the problems from which this data are derived. The reader should take a piece of paper and write out this solution for himself. The first line will consist of the above data. The second must be composed bit by bit according to the following directions. We begin by writing down the first premise with its numeral over it, but omitting the subscripts. We have now defined a premise which can be combined with this, that is, a premise containing either k prime or l. The first we find is number 5, and this we tack on with a dagger representing a plus. To get the conclusion from these, k and k prime must be eliminated, and what remains must be taken as one expression. So we underscore them, putting a single score under k and a double one under k prime. 
The results reads as L prime H. We must now find a premise containing either L or H prime. Looking along the row, we fix on number 2 and tack it on. Now, these three nullities are really equivalent to L prime H and DH prime, in which H and H prime must be eliminated and what remains taken as one expression. So we underscore them. The result reads as L prime D. We now want a premise containing L or D prime. Number six will do. These four nullities are really equivalent to L prime D and B prime L. So we underscore L prime and L. The results read as db prime. We now want a premise containing d prime or b. Number four will do. Here we underscore b prime and b. The results read as de prime. We now want a premise containing d prime or e. Number seven will do. Here we underscore d and d prime. The result reads as c prime e prime. We now want a premise containing c or e. Number three will do. In fact, must do, as it is the only one left. Here, we underscore C prime and C, and as the whole thing now reads as E prime A, we tack on E prime A sub zero as the conclusion with a Pilcrow sign. We now look along the row of data to see whether E prime or A has been given an existent. We find that A has been so given in number three. So we add this fact to the conclusion, which now stands as Pilcrow E prime A sub zero, and a sub 1, that is, Pilcrow a sub 1 e prime sub 0, that is, all a are e. If the reader has faithfully obeyed the above directions, his written solution will now stand as follows. Editorial note. The data sets referred to here may be found on the accompanying FCIT website in textual form. The listener is referred there. The reader should now take a second piece of paper and copy the data only and try to work out the solution for himself, beginning with some other premise. If he fails to bring out the conclusion a sub 1 e prime sub 0, I would advise him to take a third piece of paper and begin again. I will now work out, in its briefest form, a sorority of five premises to serve as a model for the reader to imitate in working examples. 1. I greatly value everything that John gives me. 2. Nothing but this bone will satisfy my dog. 3. I take particular care of everything that I greatly value. 4. This bone was a present from John. 5. The things of which I take particular care are things I do not give to my dog. Universe things. A equals given by John to me. B equals given by me to my dog. C equals greatly valued by me. D equals satisfactory to my dog. E equals taken particular care of by me. H equals this bone. Upon solution, nothing that I give my dog satisfies him, or my dog is not satisfied with anything that I give him. Not that in working a sorites by this process we may begin with any premise we choose. For instance, we might begin with number five, and the result would be as depicted on the accompanying FCIT website. The end of chapter two, and the end of book seven.